All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this live intraday strategy session on SB Trade Desk. Today is Wednesday, April 29th, and I'm Michael Boutros. Guys, we are just minutes away from the U.S. GDP release. Thought I'd kick things off a couple of minutes early here. Stefan, great to see you. Thanks for the heads up. Permendra, Mark, Eileen, JD, Emil. I'm sure we'll have a packed crowd today. So uh, we are just minutes away, like I said, about three minutes away from the release. Just want to take a quick look at where we are, guys, and then we'll jump right into the scalp setups from yesterday. The dollar's out, obviously in focus. Um, Chintan, great to see you. The main event risk for today is actually not going to be this GDP release, guys. It's going to be the FOMC policy decision later this afternoon. Um, we're going to be looking to see if there's any shift in the policy statement with regards to the language on expectations for a possible hike uh, or if they're going to completely omit the possibility for a hike in June. We'll go, over the, we'll go over those setups and sort of the outlook for that release in just a little bit. But a quick look at where we are ahead of the release. The dollar index supported 11,809. We broke that major key barrier yesterday. Remember, this is the fallout zone for the dollar index. So certainly near-term support, nice confluence here at the 100-day moving average and a 100% equal leg extension off the, the highs. So near-term, that's the focus. Resistance right back at uh, 11,880 near term, which would require us to break back above that median line. Looking at the relative performance, it's a split right down the middle. Uh, you know, you got the com block doing pretty poorly today. CAD down 0 0.2, Aussie down 0 0.29. Key we will look at has been our favorite as far as the intraday trades are concerned. Uh, that's down 0.34% along with the yen. Taking a quick look at the equity board, here's what it looks like so far ahead of the open. Uh, I got an email yesterday actually by someone in the room here asking about these charts. So these are Bloomberg terminal charts, guys. You're not going to, um, you know, be able to subscribe to a service like that unless obviously you get the terminal. But um, not really necessary for, for you guys. Obviously, we'll have everything for you right here. But in any event, you see European markets are trading heavier across the board. U.S. equity futures markets are actually trading heavier as well. So Dow Jones down 75 uh, points. S&P down about eight handles at this point. NASDAQ down about 20. So a little bit on a back foot. This happens ahead of major event risk, specifically anything Fed related. As far as the U.S. data stream is concerned, here's what we're looking for for today's read. So we're expecting a print of 1.0. Seasonally speaking, again, guys, we are about just um, one minute out here. Seasonally speaking, guys, just to prompt you, um, you know, the first quarter has typically for the last couple of years been lackluster. Remember, we're coming off a previous read of 2.2 for um, Q4. Q3 was exceptionally strong. So um, take seasonal effects into play. Sort of a rough winter here in the Northeast. I'm sure, um, you know, unless we get a, a, a super, super weak print, not really necessarily sure that this is going to be the major print for today. But on the back of the week NFPs that we saw, and some of the other data prints with lackluster CPI, lackluster consumer spending, you might see this start to impact what the Fed's language looks like. And we'll be looking at that later today. That being said, about 10 seconds out, GDP annualized for the, first quarter, for the first quarter, excuse me, we're looking for 1%, survey says 0 0.2, much weaker than expected. That's going to be a weaker dollar story, dollar CAD taking a break lower. Now remember, the dollar has already been exacerbated to the downside, so it would be cautious, but the broader, weaker print here is going to favor further dollar weakness near term. Here's what the dollar index looks like on the chart. So again, 11,809. If the break continues, your real next downside target, guys, isn't until 11,731. It's a big 70 pip drop here. So we'll be on the lookout. Again, follow through on these types of moves when we're heading into the interest rate decision can be very hairy. So make sure that you stay nimble on this one. Uh, as far as the dollar index is concerned, on the near-term charts, there's a 15-minute Looks like we just got a trigger to the downside. We'll see if that holds. Again, near term, 11,810, uh, 11,811, the opening range lows. Remember, this is the opening range low for London yesterday, U.S. yesterday, Sydney, Tokyo, and today's London low. So watch that as near term resistance. If you do get a snapback, that's going to be the tell if we see this thing continue lower. All right, so now that we got that out of the way, um, again, just to look through the data, core price index came in weaker than expected as well. We saw a contraction of 0.1%. Core PCE, which is the personal consumption expenditure, something the Fed likes to refer to and speak a lot about, 
Uh, also coming in slightly below expectations here with a print of 0.9%. The only highlight here, guys, is going to be that uh, personal consumption uptick from 1.7 to 1.9 expectation. Um, again, seasonally speaking, the first quarter has been, you know, typically a weaker growth from the United States. Keep in mind, this is the advanced read. So again, we'll see this revised, I'm sure, next month. But as it stands, I'm sure you're going to see all those excuses for seasonality effects start to come out. Quick look back at the equity futures board sees us a little bit, a little bit, um, a little bit of a bounce here. Actually, we were down 75 points, now down 66 here on Dow futures. So I'm not going to chase this move here, guys. We're going to want to see what the open looks like. Um, broadly speaking, it's not very strong for the dollar, but that's not necessarily going to translate in price action. So let's jump into the setups we've been following. Uh, and remember what we do here. We're not going to follow the hype. We're going to follow what price action say. So first things first, uh, the first thing that we were highlighting is the Aussie dollar. I want to bring that up on the uh, intraday charts here. So uh, for the Aussie, this is how we sort of ended out the day yesterday. Major key resistance was right into 108.20. And certainly, I'm still looking at that region right now. Um, just want to highlight a couple of things. A, this 100% extension, guys, is actually a longer dated extension. Let me show you where it's from. Um, dating back to the hot, late high that you made in 2013. So on that first leg down. Now, typically, once you've made it through a target like that, um, you know, typically we'll clean that up and we'll kind of reassess the fibs. But the fact that it caught those lows so nicely and that you've seen price action continue to pivot there, um, just has me leaving it as a target. Long story short, the median line that you see here in green is sort of the near-term bearish invalidation level. So you still have a little bit more room into that region. You're basically looking at 80.50 on a stretch higher there um, for the Aussie dollar. But you know, keep things in perspective, guys. We are at this point more than 400 pips off the low. Um, it's a reversal any way you look at it. In fact, if we bring this into a monthly chart, Okay, you're basically looking at an outside reversal month candle. Okay, which means this low took out the previous uh, candles low, and we pushed and took out the previous candles high on a reversal. So any way you look at it, you know, we want to kind of stray away from the just uh, perma bear attitude that a lot of people have had towards the Aussie. Obviously, it's been a very precipitous drop, but we need to recognize when price is speaking. So at this point, um, again, I'm a little bit cautious about trying to press the longs, but this is going to be the main resistance that we're looking at for the Aussie. Here's what it looks like on the intraday. Um, again, not my favorite scalp right now, guys. I've actually been a little bit more involved in the Kiwi, uh, and the Sterling Cross is actually starting to come back in focus as well. But that said, here's what the scalp looks like from last night. Okay. So a couple of things, 80-20, there's that region right there. It's the exact extension that we just looked at on the daily chart and that nice pivot in price. We're testing it right now. Near-term resistance just a bit higher. Like we said, 80-40, 80-50, the same thing even on the near-term chart. So if you look at that median line off the lows, yeah, we went through it yesterday, but that comes back into focus right at that same region, right around 80-40, 80-50. Also, interestingly enough, Sorry about the lag here, guys. Give me a second. If we extend a sliding parallel with this same slope, okay, off of the high that we made, it was in late March, right here, March 31st, you can see that almost caught the exact slope of the range highs that we made yesterday in price action. So um, we'll keep that sliding parallel in view, but again, highlights this region right here. All right, so heading to the U.S. session, that's sort of what I'll be looking at. Next top side target, if that does break, you're essentially looking for 80.95, just shy of the 81 handle. And that's going to be the completion of the 2618 extension. So as far as, you know, triggers, as far as actually jumping into fresh scalps on the Aussie here, um, to be quite frank with you guys, I'm not really sure there's anything in this here for me coming into um, the Fed. You know, I'm kind of a I'm kind of a wait and see right now from here on out into the FOMC policy decision. So much talk about what they could do. I'm kind of like, don't even want to look at the news anymore. Um, you know, we're just going to comb through the policy statement. If there's anything with regards to a shift in, in tone as far as, okay, the June hike is off the table, 
between me and you guys, again, my personal opinion, I do not think there's going to be any chance of a hike in June. Um, it looks like market expectations are still looking for validation that that is indeed the case. Long story short, if they push it out, um, you know, you could see that dollar continue as long as we hold below 8,000, or excuse me, 11,800, that um, level that we just broke, 11,800, 11,009. So if this thing drifts back up into this region and then you see the FOMC policy decision give a bear dollar reaction, we're looking for that drop into 11,737. Okay, that's when I'll be a little bit more more comfortable uh, scalping that long side of the Aussie on the breakout or even the euro dollar. We'll go over that in a moment as well. But broadly speaking, the data today is not going to be very supportive. All right. And also remember the game plan early in the week on Sunday on the post. Um, at this juncture, with the decline that we've seen, we're now entering the sixth consecutive day of declines. Remember yesterday. We brought up the consecutive bars indicator to check when the last time we saw a five-day stretch to the downside. Last couple of times we saw that there was a market rally uh, for a couple of days before the thing started to fizzle out, right? Well, now we're entering our sixth day of straight declines. And let's go back and see when the last time we saw that. Wait a minute. It was right here. Okay? And that was the low, <clears throat> excuse me, for August. Okay? And we held those lows, actually, before mounting a near-term recovery right into the start of September trade. Uh, and that saw a rally from 10,650 to about 10,800. So a nice 150 pip rally. Um, that's the last time we saw a five-day consecutive decline. That's not counting today, guys. Okay? Beyond that, I'm not really sure we have any examples except for a little pause here. Uh, in early 2012. We're not going to stress that. That was kind of mid-range. So be cautious, but the point of this conversation is uh, we were looking for a possible emotional low on, on Fed. So if we see this thing come into support, slam into support, the major, major downside target, let me take this back, the major, major downside target for the index you're going to want to look at is right here. It's going to be this confluence region here. Okay. So um, looking for a possible emotional load to be set on the Fed to give this thing a little bit of recovery. And again, on the way up, we'll be looking for short triggers. We'll be looking for nice entries as close as we can get to that median line. Try to press that lower bound. So very interesting on the index. Before we move into the other crosses, I do want to take a moment just to talk about gold. Uh, it's been center stage. It's been the tell for what's been going on with um, not only risk sentiment, but ex broadly speaking with the dollar as well. You know, they're starting to connect again. So the bottom line, the bottom line was the upside focus was still in play. We talked about this in yesterday's gold daily dollar setup. Um, and, you know, the focus remains way to the upside above line 1191. That was the post from 427. After this break right here, it took us through the upper median line parallel. Uh, yesterday's rally took us right through the, excuse me, reversal close day resistance, which was 1209. And right now, as we noted yesterday, the focus remains weighted to the top side above 1201, which again is going to be the close that we made here on Monday. All right. Uh, you already got a pullback today here in about 1203. That held a support. You know, the top side breach here is going to look right into 1223, 1225 is resistance. All right. Now, this type of play seems a lot more appealing and will be a lot more uh, favorable if the dollar does, in fact, press lower. Uh, but it's not going to be something that is necessary for the trade to necessarily progress. So construct above 1201 here on gold. Top side break looks for 1223, 1225. There's a lot up here, by the way. Uh, you have the median line off the low. You have the 200-day moving average. Former trend line support. The 618 extension off the low. The 50% retracement off the high. Okay. And the March stretch high. All line up in this region. So you talk about conviction levels. Doesn't get more conviction than that on gold. Questions on Buyan. 
Mark says, for Euro Oz, I'm looking for a five waves up into 138.40.50. Curious how you see things. Um, Euro Oz. Yeah, man, I'm not touching this really, uh, Mark. We were looking at this, me and Jamie, for quite some time yesterday. And we were both looking at each other asking if this was the breakout or not. Look, um, this is a huge region. In fact, I think it was you who brought it up. Uh, he says, ha ha, I did the prey trade. <laughs> um, this was a huge region. Uh, I think you brought it up yesterday on the break. The reversal at face value looks good. I'm not going to lie to you. Okay. Um, I don't know if you want to necessarily call that divergence. Almost equal lows here. Nah. But, you know, I need to see this thing get back above 37.88. Do you remember 37.88? That was the, guys, that was the, that was the support barrier. We were scalping this all last week, um, last two weeks, if you guys recall, on the intraday charts. But the whole premise of the trade was longs against 37.88, which was the low day close, as well as a nice pivot in price here for the last couple of months. Um, you know, we tested it as resistance and that held. So, Mark, I don't, um, you know, I don't have a conviction bias on this. If if we were to break this, maybe you're in for a scalp back up into former median line parallel support, now resistance. Check those highs again. But below 37.88, man, I got to stick to my guns. I can't really get too excited about it. Let's see what the intraday chart looks like. Hold on. So here's what we looked at yesterday with Euro Oz, right? And again, at its face value, uh, we talked about the fact that this looked like a clear break of the weekly opening range with the move below 38.13, essentially 38, right? And here we are testing it as resistance, and that's holding. So yeah, that's not going to be a trigger. We can work this. This is what I'll say. This is the, the, the bearish invalidation level. That's probably the only conviction I would have on a setup like this right now. Uh, if you make it through the European highs, i.e. the upper median line parallel here from the decline, short, sure. yeah, you probably get a nice scalp back into the weekly opening range high. And let's just take the retracement down to the new low. By the way, I'm going on the cuff here for you, uh, Mark. He says, I understand. Right on, man. I just want to make sure on the same page. Not really something I've been tracking um, this week, just because of the way that we started the week, price action was pretty messy. I'll tend to stray away from stuff like this, but um, this would be the level of which if you break out, sure, I'm with you. Tend not to count wave counts in too, too uh, tight of a time frame. If you start looking at wave counts, Mark, like in a five-minute chart or really, really tight time frames, um, it can really lead you astray. And the problem that I run into with that is you spend so much time sort of trying to identify the wave counts, you're, you're missing the broader picture. He says he's looking at an hourly chart. Okay. Let me see. Uh, let me bring this into an hour as well. Yeah, it could be the start. One, two, extend three is going to be the longest wave. You just tap the, the, the height of wave uh, one on the bottom of wave three. Yeah, could be. Could be. Again, either way, bearish invalidation is going to be right at the weekly opening range low, which is right in line with upper median line parallel. So it actually matches up pretty nice, Mark. Um, this is where I'd be looking as my bearish invalidation near term. And in fact, if you look at this daily chart, uh, the 60 breach there would be an invalidation. Uh, for the broader downside momentum signature. So you got a couple of things to look at there. Hope that helps, Mark. Uh, he says, thanks for looking at it. Anytime, man. Anytime. And guys, ever if you have a trade setup that you're looking at or specific pair you want to throw out there, feel free. Okay, let's just take a quick gander back. I don't want to get too far from price action here. Um, on the back of the release, let's see if the dollar, okay. Right at the lows, right at the lows. Hey, Raj says, Mike, in the event uh, of the news, i.e. the FOMC, the swing trade setup entry prices, are they still valid? 
as you can get some sharp spikes. Yeah, so Raj, the swing setups, man, we that, that we put out, those are not going to be things that we're going to want to necessarily alter or change because there's event risk on tap. Remember, we're watching the docket, right? We're not going to put out a trade out there where we think um, it's, it's going to be dependent or reliant on the data, okay? The swing setups are much more uh, objectively and broadly focused. So, you know, if, 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 if we put out a, a, or if Jamie puts out a swing setup, he's aware of the data that's on tap, you know, that shouldn't matter to you. Uh, the prices are what we follow, the prices are what we trade, Raj. I can't stress that enough. From a scalping standpoint, typically we'll start to fade out all of our positions and I'll kind of typically be flat heading into a read like that unless I'm holding a position that's in break even or the stop is, uh, you know, on the inside of the trade. Uh, but typically, um, typically that's not going to, you know, change our, our, our outlook per se. Does that make sense? All right. Raj, Raj says, yes, thanks. Appreciate that. All right. So, uh, Mark, watch that resistance level. Going right through the Kiwi scalp. So this one is a little bit more uh, favorable for me. Remember the basic premise of the trade. I don't want to beat this up. We've talked about it every day. 77.33, 77.30. Huge confluence region we've been looking at for the last two weeks. And that's the R1 monthly pivot, the October trend line, um, you know, the closed lows from October. There's a whole list of things that we can look at there. The premise has been bearish against that. And this week's rally went right into that level again, 77.33 and held. We noted yesterday in um, you know the piece that the downside bias remains in play. In terms of support, seventy six eighty eight followed by seventy six um, sixty. Here's what, or excuse me, let me show that level. Not seventy six sixty. Yes, seventy six sixty was right. Um, as far as the, the major resistance level, and that was the opening range high for the week, right? So we're going to go ahead and, and adjust targets here a little bit, guys, as we head into the FOMC to account for fresh price action. Yesterday's bearish or bullish, exact, uh, rather, invalidation level was down here. We're going to go ahead and raise that to account for time and the slope of that trend line. And that brings it right back into 76.60, which is much more comfortable as the weekly opening range high. Okay, so we're broadly looking lower below 77.30. We're looking for short triggers. You got actually a pretty nice one yesterday as this thing came right into the highs. A little bit of a fake out in overnight trade here as we opened up Europe. But below 77.30, remember, we're looking for short triggers. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, Mike, well, the dollar news was pretty bad. And, um, you know, the dollar just broke support. Why would we be looking to necessarily take a short on the Kiwi dollar? Remember a couple of things. A, the New Zealand dollar is not represented in the Dow Jones FXCM dollar index. So when we take a look at um, the dollar index price action, you got to remember that the Dow or the uh, New Zealand dollar is actually not represented in this index. Secondly, on the decline, right? If we take a look at what's been going on in broader dollar price action throughout this entire pullback, yeah, Kiwi has seen some upside. But over the last couple of days, when this thing extended and stretched its hardest, what did Kiwi do? Not a damn thing, right? Kind of held right here. Yeah, we've had a nice rally, guys. This is compressed to show you price action, but the, the range hasn't really been all that big. So that just suggests that dollar strength isn't really equating into this trade as much. So that being said, you have a very clear invalidation level here. It was last week's opening range high. We've tagged it three times. There's a nice FIB confluence up here as well. Remember, it's a 618 extension from the ascent off the lows, a 786 retracement off the highs. A measured move okay, of the rally off the low also gives you 100% here. There's a lot there. So we'll be looking for possible short triggers. And if this breaks, you're basically looking for a run into 77.90. And that's going to be the, the larger play here. Um, now, remember, for the Kiwi, why this has been such in focus heading into today is because it's a triple whammy. We got GDP. We got the FOMC. And then later this afternoon, we get the RBNZ. And while we're not expecting them to necessarily move on rates, we're going to have to see what uh, Wheeler has for us with regards to comments. He loves to shake things up. Broadly speaking, bearish invalidation, 77.33.
Raj says, Mike, do you take two lot size uh, and take target one and one's target? Do you hit your move to stop loss or break even? Absolutely. Raj, I don't necessarily want to say one or two lots per se. Um, you know, the trade size that you guys are working with is completely subjective. I can't give you any guidance on that. I can tell you that I'm trading with, you know, more than two lots even because I like to take off. I like to have the flexibility to fade out of the position. So, in fact, once I hit the first core, uh, once I've hit the first target, if it's a play that I'm going to hold, first of all, let me just say this. We're not fading out of every position. It depends on the setup. So if the trade is, for example, a breakout trade of the weekly opening range, and I'm long, this trade, yeah, I'll take off a quarter here, stops to break even. We'll take off maybe another quarter here, stops to the opening range high, and then we'll close out the trade at key resistance. That's a trade we'll fade. If we're trading within the initial range or if we're trading in a range, those are all in, all out. Okay, we're not going to try to fade those because we haven't gotten a clear-cut directional bias. Um, does that make sense? And the bring the stop to break even, you never want to do that, guys, unless you've taken something on the table as it pertains to intraday trading. Okay, everything I'm saying here is, is for the intraday strategy. Um, I'm not a big fan of just bringing the stop to break even unless I put something in my pocket. Why? Well, if the scalp was taken on a proper premise and you've already attained that first profit objective, there's not a reason that I should let that evaporate into thin air because I want a bigger, you know, I want to go for the next target. It's true, no one went broke taking break-even uh, trades, but it's also true, no one made money doing that, right? So I'm only going to break the, bring the trade to break-even if I'm taking off a quarter, a third, something in my pocket. You know, the trade was right, I've made a correct decision, I've taken something there then we'll bring it to break even. Raj, does that make sense? Uh, Adria says, if it breaks 77.90, do you wait for the pullback to buy, pullback to enter a buy, Adria says, if it breaks 77.32? Stefan says, sage advice. 77.32. <laughs> um, if it breaks 77.90? Okay, I think you're fixing it. 77.32, right. If it breaks 77.32, ideally, Adrius, and it depends when it happens, man. I, I hate to be shaky with you guys, but I'm being completely frank with you. It depends when it happens. If it breaks out on FOMC, you're not going to be able to wait for the pullback, right? If it breaks out on the announcement, you got to have real quick fingers, and depending on what price action has done, you want a conviction stop. Um, Guys, I'm going to tell you this. You're not going to want to stick with a quarter of the daily TR if you're actually trading the event risk. you got to leave a little bit more of a cushion there because the spreads can blow out. You can get some whipsaw price action. It's not for the faint of heart. If this strategy is new for you or if you're just getting started with SB, scalping an event like the interest rate decision may not be in your best interest to kick things off. If you've been in the room here for a couple of months or you've been following um, you know, the intraday reports, uh, you know how we play it. On an extended breakout, or if you get the breakout right on the release, you're probably not going to get the pullback. You know, you just got to be quick on the entry and even quicker on the exit. Um, if the if the reaction is sort of lackluster, the market thinks about it for a while, and as it filters through, then you get the break. Um, you know, that's going to be your best case scenario to wait for the pullback and then play out. It really depends what the initial reaction is right off the release. Um, and again, interest rate decisions are not always as easy as NFPs, CPIs, things where it's a number, better, worse than expected market reaction. Um, on the interest rate decision, it's all about the policy statement and how the language sounds um, with regards to where they stand on interest rates. So um, just want to give you a little bit of caution for today. It looks like that was actually a really good entry for Kiwi right now as we were just talking. Gosh darn it. <laughs> Actually, that was a trigger that just gave out here in the five-minute, guys. All right, so that was a missed opportunity right now. I'm sorry about that. kind of went on a little rant. Listen, so at the end of the day, um, the reason this would have been an interesting trade for me is because where did it come against? Right against our bearish invalidation level. So I know if this thing cracks 77.40, you know, we're probably going to rally right through into 77.90, and that's a conviction stop. Um, you know, we kind of just missed there. We should have taken that one. In any event, market will provide. It's a long day. You still have R, B, and Z uh, on tap. Hmm. 
AJ says, I prefer not play the event. And again, it's a preference thing. You know, the events, guys, the events shouldn't be something that's scary or anything. It's, it's something that breeds opportunity. Even if you don't play the actual release, the volatility that it spurs is going to create more opportunity. And always think about it like that. Sometimes I come into a trade and I'm like, well, I don't know what to do from here. Um, you know, I missed the release. Damn, this was a, move, a good move. Doesn't matter. It's just going to create a new opportunity moving forward. And that's the way you got to look at it, guys. So whether you want to trade the event or you want to trade post the event, um, the event itself is going to be a good thing for markets in general, right? Okay, uh, Raj, we'll take a look at that pair in just a moment. I kind of just want to get through the rest of the scalps. Uh, here is the euro dollar. So I moved this from the radar yesterday to the main intraday page just on account of the event risks that we're heading into today. Um, and I think everyone's looking at the euro, and it's really important to keep in mind the major key levels that we looked at yesterday. So for those of you in the room, uh, I think Mark is one that was really favorable of this trend line. Remember that major play, right? Really nice pivot. Above that, you got to stay constructive. And that's what we've been trying to do here on the euro. So I'm still in the mentality of sort of buying dips. I do think um, if you max out into 11, 11, uh, 111, 111, 20, I do think that's a huge region of resistance of which you want to just sit on your hands if you're holding longs into that resistance level, close out that position and kind of just wait it out. Um, you know, the more analysis I did on this yesterday, the more things kept on lining up right there. You got 100% extension off the low. Um, you got a long dated 100% extension here. Okay, this is uh, an extension from the decline off the late 2013 high like we looked at in Aussie. You got a 618 retracement from the decline off the February highs. Um, you know, there's a lot there's a lot stacked up here. Ahead of that even, you still have this median line off the lows, which is still kind of capping the advance. Here's what Euro looks like on the intraday. All right, so we got a, we got a stretch right into that region that we talked about in the report yesterday. That's right here, uh, 110.35. It's exactly where we kind of just pushed right through into 110.69, 110.70 even on this stretch. And here we are pulling back below. Big region, guys, big region. If we zoom out a little bit to give this thing some perspective, I know we're a little messy on the, um, on the median lines here, guys, but they're all in play, and they've actually been really clean. So let me kind of just zoom out here real quick. Okay, <clears throat> so these orange median lines that you're looking at here are actually median lines that date back all the way to the highs that we've made like February, January. Um, and you can see how many times we've still continued to pivot along that slope. The last one that we were looking at was this one, right? Real clean pivots. Caught the extended rally back at the start of the month. It was the opening range high peak this week. And that's what validated the upside break with a move above 109.25 um, yesterday. The high that we just made, well, here's another median line parallel off that same slope. Nothing's different. Okay? And that same slope, yeah, we overshot it a little bit, but coincides right now with the median line off the low. And the highs that we made for the month. So on an objective break, if we just take, if we just take uh, a, a move back, right, we made a huge opening range for April. And here's the break to the upside if we move higher, which is why, for me, the 111 region is going to be so huge. Because that, for me, would be the breakout sort of conviction or the confirmation, rather, uh, of a more significant uh, break, break up or breach here rally for the euro. Uh, so near term, look for support around 109.90. Um, you know, if we break back below the median line, this is sort of a butter zone of which uh, if you get a drop like this, if you get a dollar correction, would be a beautiful entry. I think um, swing trades are looking for something similar as far as entries uh, against that region. But, you know, it's an uptrend at resistance, guys. Don't let anyone fool you into thinking, oh, this is, you know, the sell of the century here for continuation. It could be. But right now, from what intraday price action is saying, from what the broader scope price action is saying, it's simply an uptrend at resistance. All right. Um, 
Guys, does that make sense on where we stand with the euro right now? Mark says, now I get it. You keep the MLs, but delete the pitchfork. Yeah, Mark, I don't stress if it's a pitchfork or an ML now. They're all, it's the same exact thing. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes I'll just, you know, keep the slope lines because I don't want the median line per se anymore. Price action hasn't really been respecting it uh, or what have you. But uh, what we're stressing always is the slope, the gradient that the market is traveling at. He says, I mean, so you don't clutter up the chart. Exactly. Yeah, Mark. If you're looking at your charts, guys, there is a huge drawback in over analysis. I find myself doing that sometimes, too. It doesn't matter how long you've been doing it. You fall into that pit sometimes where you're just tacking on, oh, well, this might look good. Oh, darn, there's a moving average here. Oh, look, there's a pivot. Let me tack on, you know, uh, donching channels or something. It can get ridiculous, right? Sometimes um, the KISS approach is going to be best. Um, you know, the more clarity you have in your analysis, the cleaner the decisions you make as far as trading. That's just what I've seen. Stefan says a pitchfork is an ML with equal distance lines between, or excuse me, with equal distance between the lines, right? Isn't that the essence of it? 100%, Stefan. There's no difference, right? Yeah. I can do median line analysis without pitchforks at all, guys. It's the same thing, right? It's just that the median line is going to give you the range of the mean of that channel formation. So it's going to just split it right down the middle for you. Sometimes that median line is very, very helpful in broader setups and broader scope formations. Sometimes if you're really near-term price action, you're looking at a five-minute chart, you know, the median line is not really in focus. It's just the, the channel resistance and support. All right. Stefan says, that's the way I've always thought about it. I look for MLs first, then the pitchfork. Right on, brother. Right on. The median line can be a nice assertion of where in the channel you want to be playing. So, for example, Stefan, the, the benefit of the median line is that, let's say today we get a reversal off this, right? This was in here. Again, I wouldn't know to play necessarily the short side, but from a scalping standpoint, from an intraday standpoint, this would shift our focus. We could play the downside, right? But I know because the median line's there, it's given me that conviction to play a short within the broader uptrend. Uh, same thing on the breakout. You know, it's hard to justify longs when you've made a rally like this. But once we clear the median line, sometimes that gives you the further conviction. You know what? It's time to press that upper median line channel. So it does serve a purpose, um, but you're absolutely right. It's, it's, um, it's basically the same thing that we're looking at when we're trying just to find the slope of the gradient. Mark says, thanks, Stefan. Stefan, love the cross action, guys. Keep those questions coming. I'm sure there's tons of people in the room who have similar questions. Theory says median line acts as a magnet, correct? Yeah. So there's always going to be a, re, uh, a tendency to return to the median line uh, on a continuation or a reversal. Stefan says, hey, I'm learning. <laughs> awesome, guys. Awesome. All right. So let's jump right into um, the euro dollar scalp. Here's what it looks like on the intraday. So again, um, we're watching this median line here. We're kind of keeping an eye on where things are. The scalp remains at risk as far as the long side is concerned below 110.35. This region right here, remember that's what we highlighted last night as near-term bearish invalidation level. Again, a break above that, and I'll be looking for a push into 111. Um, questions on euro dollar. Keep in mind that right now we are pressing some divergence, right? Price action, higher high, higher high, higher high, higher high, lower high, lower high. In fact, it might be. Nah, I don't really wouldn't operate on that per se, guys, because your stop would need to be as low as 109.80 at this point. It's a little bit further than I'd like to see, but um, that's what we'll be looking at heading into the FOMC. Did it break already on the euro dollar, says Adrius? No. So remember, on these emotional spikes on price, we're never going to chase those. On the pullback, the fact that it went right back below 110.35, you know, I'm going to be on the sidelines here, not necessarily going to press this until we get the U.S. Open minimum. Um, I'm not going to get caught buying euro dollar at the highs. Raj says, Mike, when you say longs are at risk, would you yourself will enter the trade? When I say, yeah, this is a good question, Raj. I'm sure that someone else has a question like that. When I say longs are at risk, it means as we're coming into that region, 
any long exposure I have, I'm closing out, and I'm on the lookout for short triggers. That's exactly what it means. You guys can write that down if you want. When I say longs are at risk into 110.35, it means if you're holding long exposure, this is where you want to be booking profit and bringing your stops in. And at the same time, if you're flat, this is where we want to be on the lookout for short triggers. It means the market is vulnerable there. Um, you know, it's a major key resistance. Be on the lookout. Remember, we always have to have something to trigger the trade. So we are looking at these key levels, and then once we get to those levels, it's not just, okay, I'm at 110.35, let me sell. No, now I'm on the lookout. Is there a short trigger in momentum that's going to put me into the trade? If you don't get it, you can't take the short. That's very simple. You know what I mean, Raj? So one should wait for the pullback uh, from the spike on the euro dollar. Well, again, on the euro, we didn't really get a trigger on that move. Let me see what the near-term chart looks like. Yeah, the euro dollar wouldn't have been a trade for me on this one, guys. I would have definitely been on the Kiwi um, as we just made that. Or uh, where was it? Uh, well, first of all, the Aussie or the Kiwi. Either one would have been a, a better play for me. I think the Kiwi probably would have been the, the, the favored one just because you're trading against 77.33. That's the level. That's, you know, the major level that we just talked about. That trigger hasn't even given out yet on the five. Seventy six ninety four. Still might be a decent play. Let's bring it back to Kiwi for a second here, guys. We might get an opportunity to get in on this. Whoop. Yeah, I still think we kind of missed the entry on this one. So. Again, the better the better setup here would have been to try to fade that move with a like ten pip stop against the highs on the emotional play. Uh, at this point now, this is the huge U.S. opening range, and you're right in the middle. So any stops you take could be against these highs. It's going to be basically a thirty pip stop. Quarter of the daily TR is about twenty five. So not ahead of the data. Not ahead of data. And again, S and B or uh, R B and Z, excuse me, on tap today. Yeah, that would have been a great entry on that on that spike higher. He said that shouldn't affect the swing trade setup. No, Raj. Yeah, keep the two separate, my man. Listen, guys, the swing trades are not going to change because of any data prints. <laughs> Very rarely, unless they come out and raise interest rates today. I don't. Uh, I don't think Jamie puts that into account. So you know, uh, keep that in mind. All right, moving right along. So we've covered the Kiwi, we've covered the Euro, covered gold. I do want to take a quick minute and talk about Aussie Yen. Uh, I highlighted this setup yesterday on Daily FX. We put it on the radar. Listen, there wasn't really a play here as far as um, where we were, but now the resistance range and the key target that we were looking for just hit. That's 95.50. What's that 95.50? 200-day moving average. Right on with the 100% extension off the lows. Okay, and a decent healthy pivot in price as well. Um, that's the near-term resistance that we're checking right now. This is a breakout any way you look at it. So despite the fact of whatever the yen cross is doing in and of itself, taking things on its own merit, 93.05 was a basic break of the monthly opening range. And guys, these are the one of the cleanest opening range breaks that you'll see. Um, uh, or or, or what, it is the cleanest opening range break that you can probably see this month on hold. Here's the start of April trade. You press into a low. You test a high on the 10th. The range is set. You check the lows again, holds. You check the highs again, holds. Breakout, bullish against the lows, looking to stretch into a late month high. It's the 30th of the month, or tomorrow will be the 30th. So real clear play. Initial targets um, have already been hit. Again, 95.50 is pretty big here on the overlap, but next topside objective, 96, and a breach higher above that, you're looking at the upper median line parallel. All right, constructive above, basically 93.80. Uh, you're looking at the 100-day moving average there. You're looking at the median line bisector. They both line up pretty nicely just below the 94 handle. Here's what the intraday chart looks like for Aussie yen. Okay. 
So, here's where we were yesterday. We had a little bit of a pullback there, held right into the 95 handle. Okay, momentum held 50. Uh, the trigger wasn't as clear on this one, and to be quite frank, again, on, on a night like tonight, where we're ahead of the Fed, that's sort of what you would have used as your trigger. The stop would have had to been against 94.86, but actually it would have been within the 26 pip range. The only reason you wouldn't want to take that is because the profit target was pretty tight, right? It was pretty tight at 90, uh, 95.50. So again, uh, that was a break of the European opening range high. A lot of these setups, guys have been panning out European trade. So again, you guys do have the, uh, the cream of the crop there if you're trading European hours. Uh, bottom line, there's that 96 barrier on the near-term chart. If you look at the scale chart, guys, here we are. Nice confluence region with the upper median line parallel just off the lows from the month. So this is the one that you're looking at on the daily chart, this broader pattern. Within that, embedded, here's the median lines I've been watching. And again, gives you a confluence region there right around 96 if we break higher. So to take a, a, a swing, just that one step back for the question that you asked, Raj, where longs are at risk, in my opinion, longs are going to be at risk as you head into 96 in your term because of this formation. So if you're holding long exposure, again, this is where you want to be trimming it out. On the way up, you'll be looking for short triggers right around this region. Bullish invalidation near term is going to be 94.50. And again, 93.80 is going to what, what puts us back on the bearish camp if that breaks. But this is going to be near term what your bullish invalidation. All right, so that is the uh, quick update on the Aussie yen. As a disclaimer, again, um, you know, it's going to be on the radar right now. I don't really have any, uh, haven't really taken any positions. Near term, you're at resistance. Here's a decent trigger in price. And let's just bring up the five-minute chart here on Aussie Yen. See if there is. And see if there are any, yeah, clear opening ranges. Okay, so the opening range for uh, London, New York high comes in right around 90, right around that resistance level. Uh, the opening range low on the back of that data spike is going to be 95.28, 95.28 right here. Just going to drop a line there. Okay, so that's the opening range low for U.S. Uh, if we set up with a nice opening range here into like 9.45.10, you get the break. That actually might be a really nice short trigger against the highs. Uh, vice versa, if you get the break to the upside, target 96 against 95.30, that might be a decent play too. Not bad. Not bad, but wait till that 9.30 open at least before uh, I try to play a range like that. Raj says, Aussie Kiwi, please, I'm thinking long on the breakout on an hourly and hold this for a long time with the RBNZ dovishness. So Aussie Kiwi is a very interesting trade. Um, I like your mentality, man. I like your mentality. Today's actually really, really big. I'm cautious about trying to take any long exposure from this level on account of what you're doing today, i.e. you're testing the R1 monthly pivot. We don't really give too much credence to that, but it coincides with the 100-day moving average. It coincides with the operative median line parallel resistance, right? And momentum is at 60. All things that don't want me pressing the longs at the highs, Raj. Okay? Uh, we got to get... You know, we, we got to get away from that. Still long from exactly 101. Yeah, Mark, I remember that entry. Really, really gutsy, man. Well, well done, sir. Well done. Yeah, it's a big old breakout any way you look at it. I mean, this thing broke out back on the 23rd of the month on just that day. Excuse me, the um, uh, 24th. On just that day, it was a clear objective break of the monthly opening range. Very, very close to what you saw in Aussie Kiwi, guys. He set a range here within the first six days of trade. And he sat in it all month long before finally breaking the upside, looking for a late month stretch to a high. Tomorrow's the 31st, the 30th, right? Um, 
So I definitely agree with you as far as the directional bias is concerned. I think that's backed up by the fundamentals as well as far as what you're seeing from the divergence there. I think everyone's gotten a little bit too ahead of themselves on the Aussie. And if there's going to be any upside on the on the com crosses, I do believe, I do favor Aussie strength more so than Kiwi, which would have me looking higher here at Aussie Key. Now, um, the momentum signature, we kind of need to see a 60 break. We haven't seen one essentially since uh, July of last year. Uh, the last time we saw a 60 break to the upside in momentum, every single sub, uh, rally we've seen has been capped by that 60 region, and every single correction higher has turned lower from there. So we're going to kind of want to see this give out. That would be a really nice trigger with a hold above this region today. And if we do clear it, you're looking at 105.09 as just a near-term target, just a near-term target. Um, let's look at near-term price action for Aussie Key. Again, bear with me. I haven't really been following this one as closely, so not in the intraday. Just a second, guys. Sorry about that. Let that... Uh Let that load. Okay, that's that. I need. I thought. I thought that needed to snap. All right, <laughs> now it makes a little more sense. So there's the upper median line parallel that we're looking at in the daily chart. Um, that almost caught the highs, almost to the spike. I think uh, earlier yesterday, almost, almost. Um, and here's the breakout here today. So we'll want to see us hold above this region for the session. Uh, 104.64 is going to be a soft target. That's going to be a basic 88.6 from the decline off the March highs. And then right up into 105.09 is what I'd be looking at. I want to see where your question is on this, Raj. I, I want to, you're, so you're looking at Aussie Key. Uh, you're looking to play the long side. I think we're both on the same page with regards to directional bias. I just get concerned. Uh, you know, a lot of the questions you've been asking have been sort of at the long side of trades that are already at the highs. So remember, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're, 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 we're choosing our entries with critical with a lot more prudence. So he says, so how do we enter the long side, Raj? So you've missed the long side from a scalp basis here, period. I can't really validate you getting long from anywhere because you know the stop would essentially need to be below 103.80. Okay, that's like 40 pips from where you are right now. Quarter of daily chart is only 20. So I got no trades on this one here. Uh, the place you'd want to try to start looking long again is sort of right here. This is where I'd be interested in possibly looking at the long side again. Or if price action develops, okay, and you press into this 104.64 target, then you get a pullback, right? Maybe an opening range low for Asia comes in, and then it breaks to the upside. Then you take the long. But, you guys, once the scalp is gone or once the break has happened, just look at somewhere else because the reset's not going to happen right there and then. You're going to have to take a step back. It might take another session before I can do anything on the long side here. The... The entry is paramount, guys. The entry is the most important thing. Um, so we really got to be prudent. I don't want to, you know, open up a, uh, a, a, a habit of, you know, starting to look for, to chase these trades. It's a quick way to make a mess of things. So, yeah, it's a breakout. Appreciate it. Recognize it. That's cool. But that doesn't mean that there's actually a play here intraday. I need to wait for either a pullback. I need to wait for a signal to put me on the long side. Um, I have no way of putting any decent, uh, risk management on this trade at this point without, you know, while maintaining rather what our risk to reward ratio should be. Raj, I don't mean to pick on you, but does that make sense, man? I'm just kind of getting that feeling from this question. So we want to make sure we're, we're staying prudent here. Uh, you know, for the Aussie, Stevens isn't going to like this strength. Yeah, Mark, I, um, I'm sure it's just a matter of time before you see them start jawboning that thing. Um, 
not to the degree maybe that Wheeler will, but you know, I can't trade like that, Mark, right? It doesn't matter. The technicals are saying what they're saying. I'm not going to, yeah, he might come and interrupt things and he might drop a statement that causes a 400 pip pullback, but you know what? Uh, might offer a better entry for the long side again. Doesn't matter, guys. My man, Mark, appreciate that. Did we look at Euro Yen for a short? Adrian says, let's take a look at Euro Yen. Um, I'm not looking on the short side per se. I'm not sure what um, what you're looking at there, Adrius, but let's take a quick look at what the near-term price action is saying here. So I haven't actually been watching Yuri yet. You can see this is kind of stale here on the charts, guys, so bear with me one moment. Uh, I think Jamie's been all over the Yuri Yen trade. Uh, there is an active trade or a pending trade open. Uh, for a euro yen setup that he's looking at for the short side, but oops. You know, 131.30 was the line of sand for me. Okay, so what was lined up at 130, 130, 130.40? Had a 618 extension from the advance. Uh, off the lows. That's not really what I'm stressing. You have a 50% retracement of the range. So make sure this fib is in the right area. From the highs that you made in February. And you had the upper median line parallel and both of those coincided right there with the operative median line. So yeah, I'm not really necessarily looking for a short if we push through this on a closed basis here today. Euro yen on the intraday. Let's check it out. Yeah, okay. So for my purposes, looking at this from an intraday strategy standpoint, you know, this was a clear objective break of resistance, A, that we've been watching. 100% extension means uh, the corrective play is not the correct one on this one. It's a little bit more. Um, and also, it's an objective break of the weekly opening range. It was your Monday, Tuesday stretch, stretch. You broke it. You look for, you know, a stretch into a Wednesday, Thursday high. It's, we're right there. Um, now, don't forget, tomorrow is going to be the last day of the month, guys, so price action gets kind of wicked here as you get into that region. A lot of flows, a lot of people coming out, you know, closing out some positions, clearing out their books. A lot of times you'll see that portfolio re rebalancing happen. Uh, it's not a quarterly close, so I don't expect it to be too big, but I tend to trust intraday price action much less on the first last days of the month, just so you guys know. Um, in any event, 131.66, 131.38. Let me just show you what this is real quick. I just want to make sure that 236 still has merit. Yes, it does. Okay. So this is a larger, longer dated retracement. It's interesting that I have on the, on the chart for the 30, but not the daily. But this is from the December highs of last year. Okay. Uh, and that 236 comes in at 131.66. So pretty darn close high to the FOMC high that we made here back in March. Remember, this was the FOMC day um, with Yellen's presser and all that good stuff and all that jazz. We spiked right into that level. Here we are again. Beyond here, you know, the breakout target is 132.60. And that's a basic 618. Right here, 132.60. Okay, and you can see a scenario here, guys. This is the first 50 break we've seen in momentum since here. Okay, go back and look at price action. Don't take my word for anything. This oh, this uh, break above 60 here, was, or excuse me, break above 50 here, was accompanied with a break of that week's opening range. Take it to the top side. 60 break here was actually a break of the monthly opening range for October. And that gave you a nice rally right into the highs. So again, Here's the opening range high for the month. Objectively, if we clear this on a closed basis, you got to keep looking higher. 132.60 would be the next target. Does that make sense? Adrius on Euro Yen. Today's close is going to be pretty big, guys. If we close below this on the 131.30 level, it's probably the biggest fake out ever, and you want to look to fade that right back into 130. Uh, if we don't and we do close above it, you know, I don't want any part of the short side per se. Adrian says, yes, awesome. 
Terrence says, uh, what are the settings for the purple and green MAs, Mike? So the purple, uh, on my daily charts, guys, this is just going to be a staple. The purple will always be a 100-day moving average, simple moving average. They're called SMAs, guys. I don't know why Trading Station loves calling them MBAs, but uh, it's, just the, it's just a simple moving average. And the uh, green ones will always be the 200-day moving averages. Again, not a major market, uh, not a major technical factor that I want to look at, Terrence. But when they overlap and they coincide, like I say every day, with major key fibs, trend lines, pivots, you know, that's when the moving averages to me speak a little bit more louder. I was curious why. I was curious. That's why I asked Master Mike. <laughs> Cheers, Adrian. Appreciate that. All right. Um, so that's the outlook here for Euro Yen. I mean, there's really no need to fight this guy as long as we're above. Um, you know, above that 31.30 level. Last but not least, on the radar from yesterday is also Dollar Cad. Uh, you know, we've been watching this one for the last three, day, three days on the radar, and it's been a slow, slow progression to the downside. You know, Jamie's been on this one really nicely. 120.95, we're looking for 119.88 um, on the short. It's been a slow grinder, um, but we hit it today, okay? Um, this is the 38.2 retracement, basic, basic retracement, nothing fancy, uh, off of the, the lows that you made in July. Okay. More importantly, and a little bit of a, uh, a sneaky uh, median line right here off the lows, which caught all of those lows that we made throughout the advance in 2013 and even you know, drifted and caught that last low here in 2014. Uh, that median line comes just lower, and that's the highlighted region that you see there, uh, like at 119.50 at this point, maybe even lower, in 1945 here. So that's the major key support. Again, you can see a scenario where Fed comes out, dollar jackknifes a little bit lower across the board, and then rallies through the roof and really rips some heads off. A scenario like that, you know, would have me looking for support right in this pocket right here. So nothing's really changed, guys, from the outlook that we had back in the start of the week. Uh, the dollar breakdown is, is definitely accelerated a little bit faster than we expected on the break of this median line sort of confluence here that we made yesterday. Um, but still looking for today's event to possibly charge a new low and possibly see this thing start to base and get a little bit of recovery to the upside so we can short it again. Um, so keep that in mind on the dollar crosses that we're looking at. Don't be surprised if they extend a little bit more, even on the back of the release, and then we start to fade it. Uh, that being said, you guys have all the invalidation levels marked up for you, so you know what we're looking at. Euro awe is three holds of 40, and now above 50. It might be something for a scalp. Euro awes says Mark. Let's take a look at Euro awes. Yeah, this one again. We looked at this, right? Um, yeah, Mark, you know my invalidation levels, man. It it, it does look pretty good. The construct the the momentum signature looks constructive. I'm not going to fight you on that. Even on the five minute, it looks constructive. If you're nimble enough, I mean, this is this is pretty constructive right here. In fact, you even have some divergence on those lows. Uh, and here is a trigger off the highs. And price would have me looking at this. Divergence, very minor, but it's there. Bring this into a line chart, you'll see it a little bit cleaner. Right? Lower low, slightly lower lows, slightly higher highs, trigger break. Looks all right. I just, you know, again, you're you're heading into resistance, man. So just keep that in mind. We need to clear 3789 in my mind to, to validate any type of reversal. This could be just a break of support, check his resistance, resumption in which case you're going to take a long right here at the highs, right? So here's the thing, guys. If the broader setup doesn't put me in a, in a favorable scenario where if the trade starts panning out, I'm actually at a great entry, then I don't even want to go there. 
right? I don't even want to go there. There, are, you know, we have ten different setups we just went over. So we want to make sure we're picking and choosing, cherry picking the best setups. You know, if you come to the intraday trade guys, and you know, we're blessed to have like ten setups here. By no means am I scalping ten pairs at the same time. Those are what I'm looking at. We're we're thumbing through those all day. We're cherry picking the best signals. So. Um, you know, a lot of times you'll fall into love with a certain setup and a certain pair, and you're kind of just tracking it step by step. On those trades, guys, sure, if you're nimble enough, go for it. I'm with you 100%. But, um, you know, on a trade like this where you're flirting with a major disaster support break, you know, I'm not going to really get too, uh, too excited here just yet. I tend to get hung up on a pair. Difficult for me to change. Mark, that's – let me let me take a step back. It's good for you us to have focus and have pairs that we're looking at and we're really focused on, we're comfortable with the way they've been moving, there's technical clarity in the formations that they're trading within, uh, but there's a difference between that and kind of, you know, trying to press a trade because that might not necessarily be there, right? We want to make sure all your decisions are more objective necessarily than, oh, it's because I've been watching Bureau Laws. So I hope that offers some clarity. A quick look here, um, Terrence saying, what are, I already got that question. Stefan says, request, when you wrap it up, could you repeat the top trades you are watching for the day? I'd like to watch, I'd like to be watching what you are watching. Sure do, Stefan. And man, uh, you know, I'm surprised to hear you say that. The top trades I'll be watching are always going to be the ones that I have posted. If I'm posting it on the intraday page, it means I'm looking at it. The one thing I don't have on these guys that I've been looking at, to be quite fair, and that I have been sort of messing around with is the Sterling Crosses. Um, I'm not going to lie to you. I already told you guys yesterday, I got stopped out of this twice already on the short side as we were heading into this region 181 early in the week. Uh, and then here on the breakdown even, you know, there was another opportunity where it looked like a trigger gave out that reverse course and took me out again. So, you know, I'm not going to sit you and point you out into the trades that I haven't necessarily um, had all that much uh, conviction on, but the Sterling Crosses, guys, huge, huge, huge levels here, huge levels. Um, Stefan says, I didn't realize what's posted is always what uh, are the top dogs. Whoops, I didn't say that right. <laughs> I got you, Stefan. I mean, man, yeah, those are the ones I'm going to point you on in the direction where I think there's the most technical clarity. Um, does that make sense? He says, gotcha, right on. So that's why we took the euro dollar off the radar yesterday and put it on um, the intraday page is because I do think let, let me take a let me take a step a step back and, and kind of just give you a quick outlook. We're way over on time here, by the way, guys. But major event risk today, so I want to leave you on the right foot. In the event of dollar sell off, okay, meaning the dollar accelerates to the downside. Let's say these guys come out and say, you know what, ah, 2014, 2015 is not even on the radar anymore. Very unlikely scenario, but if they do, um, you know, a pullback in the euro dollar would be very well suited. You know, I'd be looking for a pullback into 109 broader story is I'm still constructive. That's a great area of which even 109.20 of which I would like to actually start initiating logs. But there's an opportunity to play that pullback on a stronger dollar play. The better one of the stronger dollar play is what's on the radar with dollar cat. I kind of wrote this yesterday. I think if dollar cat, if the dollar does rally, you see again a dip into this major region, this would be a, a, a long that you can sort of fade. That being said, these trades are at some major invalidations. So if dollar CAD breaks down beyond that lower median line parallel, you're looking at 117.25. If your dollar breaches through this major near-term resistance, well, you're probably looking at uh, 111, 111.20. If um, you know, there's a lot of if-then statements here, but we're heading into a major event risk. If Kiwi dollar, I, I kind of kicking myself still because I think that was a great entry we just missed here against that high. But in any event, if Kiwi Dollar blasts through 77.31 on a weaker dollar story, this would be a region of which, again, we'd start to look for more significant resistance. So Aussie, Kiwi, Euro are going to be the ones I'm focused on. As far as the crosses are concerned, Aussie Yen, which, which is the chart posted on the radar, um, another one that could whoop, stop traffic. Looks like we're going to punch through this. All right. Yeah. Again, hard to <laughs> hard to justify any type of play here, guys, because there's nowhere to put your stop with conviction, but there is the break. So again, on a trade like this, 
we've been constructive, right? But I missed the break. So the play for me at this point is maybe on a rally into set 96, maybe look for short triggers there to play a little bit of a pullback, looking for 25 pips per scalp initially. Does the mentality follow, guys? Stefan, does that make sense? He says, thanks for the clarity on everything and excuse any stupid... There's no such thing, guys. I want to make sure we're all on the same page. I'm way over on time. Um, stay tuned. Again, we will uh, have uh, Jamie's Intraday Strategy webinar later today uh, at 1 o'clock. Um, actually, I'm not sure if we're going to be pressing that one right ahead of the release. I'll let, I'll let you guys know on the uh, SB Squawk. But guys, best of luck trading today. Stay prudent. Let the opening range happen here and let's get through some of this... Uh, some of this chop here before we start to get into the interest rate decision. Don't forget, as far as the Kiwi is concerned, our favorite play or the one that we're trying to hold against 7733. Don't forget they have the RBN's interest rate decision after the close of U.S. markets today. And, you know, typically can be a pretty volatile uh, release for the Kiwi. Best of luck trading. I will see you all tomorrow morning uh, at 830 Eastern. Cheers.